Am I trying to satisfy a psychological issue or am I actually trying to address an actual cosmetic concern? I knew in my gut I shouldn't have taken that patient on. And it, but they did it because they were coerced or they felt they had a duty to help that patient. It, if your gut says no or there's any other indication, just don't do it. Like I said before in this podcast, this is all about honesty uh, and integrity. So I'm not going to lie to you and say I've never had a complaint. It does happen. The trick is knowing how to handle it when it does happen. So how we could prove anything, we couldn't. So the actual costs associated with those claims were £100,000 each. We had wow. to settle them because we spent or some- essentially what was just missing documentation is they take it personally and they go into denial and they then lash back out at the patient saying, how dare you, no, you're wrong. And it becomes a, a fight. But talk to us, we're here to help you. We're here to support you. And we've been doing it a long time now. So, you know, we're not here just to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Dr. Rosh. Thank you so much for joining us on Sliding Into The DMs. We appreciate your loyalty. Um, make sure you like, subscribe and comment. Let us know what you want to talk about. Today, we're going to be talking about insurance. Speaking personally, whenever I sign insurance, I never read the details. So we have Naomi from Lockton Insurance who will be able to explain everything to us. We also have Amrit, our CEO. Um, so let's get Straight on into it. Perfect. So, Naomi, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Hi there. Uh, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, so, I'm Naomi. I've been working in aesthetic insurance about 15 years now in total. Um, we specialise at Lockton in aesthetic practitioner insurance. Um, and it has always intrigued me and fascinated me because of the nature of the industry. Um, the aim of the insurance ultimately is to protect you in all of your practice um, and helping your clients, obviously, if there are any complications. Okay, perfect. And um, can you just explain to us in layman's terms what, what the insurance is, what aesthetic indemnity is? Ultimately, it can be called different things. Mm -hmm. So you may hear it as aesthetic insurance, you may hear it as cosmetic insurance, you might hear it also as professional indemnity. Um, it's all the same thing. It is protecting you for the services and the treatments that you're providing to your clients. Um, so if there is a complication, or even if there isn't a complication, but you receive a complaint or a claim, then that's what we're here to do, is to help you. Wonderful. Support you. Well, we definitely need it. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, complaints are on the rise. Uh, why do you think this is? I would say that quite... The amount of complaints is still actually quite... What's the word? Uh, plateauing, okay. I suppose. I haven't seen a particular increase. We did think post-COVID there may be mm. a spike. Um, but there's always quite a fair few. So to put that into perspective, I would say that out of all of the dermal filler claims, for example, that we've had, which I would say is probably about 30% of the types of claims that we receive, mm -hmm. um, only 26% of those get paid out. Okay. Um, so that means that 75% don't. Uh, they are just general complaints and actually can be resolved by way of refund or offering further treatment if appropriate. Mm. And what sort of complaints do you get in dermal filler? Is it things like lumpiness, bumpiness, that sort of thing? It's quite often dissatisfaction with mm -hmm. just the output of, or the outcome of the treatment. It can also be general side effects that the patient may have uh, consented to. And then the most rare, really, the most rare complaints or claims are actually where there is a physical industry, mm. injury, sorry, not industry, um, that is actually more serious that needs further treatment or a surgical intervention for example but those are rare mm. it can be a little bit scary when you're doing a treatment and your patient just might not like it um amrit i've seen your work you do beautiful work has yeah. this ever happened to you in the past so i think um it's an injury where you get a very mixed bunch of patients you get patients that sometimes need the smallest tweak where you know in in a specific part of their face and it and it kind of crosses the boundary between this term of body dysmorphic disorder versus generally a person wanting to improve their physical appearance mm. and it's almost determining who is more likely to complain or am i trying to satisfy a psychological issue or am i actually trying to address an actual cosmetic concern and in in the past where i've actually not been very good in my assessment and judgment there and i might have treated someone who had more of a psychological issue underlying their reason for treatment, mm -hmm. then of course that reason is never going to go away. So no matter what I do in terms of my treatment cosmetically, they are always dissatisfied and they can then sometimes cause issues with complaints or wanting refunds or wanting mm -hmm. further, further treatment. And sometimes they're willing to pay, but it's about setting that boundary that this is not going to address the underlying concern and they need other treatment or other help. 
Um, so it, it, it can be quite challenging. It can be quite challenging. It's definitely a skill that you have to learn to try and identify uh, these sort of patients. What, what sort of things have you seen or identified to think this is someone that may not be able to have an improvement with my aesthetic treatment? Um, so I look for specific red flags in my patients. I look mm. for patients where they've been to multiple different practitioners, mm. but always dissatisfied. Like it's fine for someone to move around the country and to live in different places and have treatments by different practitioners. But if they say that every single person they've ever seen has been bad, and this is why they come to me, then I'm probably going to be added to that list of bad practitioners after they've had treatment. So it may not be an actual genuine cosmetic concern. It might be BDD or other underlying, underlying issues. The other aspect is um, how quickly do they want treatment? Are they pushing me or urging me for treatment? Can I actually see what they're talking about? Is there actually a visible cosmetic issue that can be corrected? Or is it something that's just in, in, in their eyes and I can't pick up on? Because you know, as a cosmetic doctor, that is my specialty, to be able to address and correct these issues. I should be able to see things before they can notice them rather than the other way around. So I think that's that's the biggest thing I've learned uh, is is trying to address these factors so I don't treat the wrong patient and I make sure that those I'm treating are less likely to complain. And it's about having a good service, a good customer friendly service. So remember, it's not always about a cosmetic issue or a complaint about the treatment. It can be a bit the way they're booked in, the journey. I'm sure Naomi can kind of go through other, other examples, but it's, it's, it's sometimes the way you handle them or mm. what you said or the way you then followed them up or the lack of follow-up. These sort of things can be the trigger for the complaint or the way that your staff in the clinic might have made them feel. Mm. All these variables can be a reason for complaint. Social media consent for their photography to be used or lack thereof is another minefield mm. sometimes you so proud of the work you've done you always want to share it with other colleagues and other individuals but remember although it's a visual industry without patient consent for sharing their photographic consent you know on social media or on your website mm. we can't do that as, as as ethical gmc registered doctors that would be you know against my rules do you think verbal consent is enough or do you think written is better has to be written. It has to be written. What are your thoughts, Naomi? Written and signed for and dated. Mm. Is that something you've seen? Of issues where patients have complained about the way they've treated or their pathway in the clinic or yeah. follow up? I think when you've got a particular patient that is quite dissatisfied about everything, there's not really a treatment specific um, problem, so to speak. It's more of an all round journey, which is when you really have one of those red flag patients that you kind of mentioned as a whole. Um, Yes, everything gets incorporated. It's always also worth bearing in mind that if you actually have a formal claim that goes down the legal route, the solicitors that will send you a letter of claim, for example, often have many different reasons in which they're holding you responsible for the claim, and these are also elements that will be pulled into it. So in terms of the written documentation, I mean, this is something that I will talk all day long about mm. about the importance of it because it is key um so verbal in all areas whether it's from your consultation from your booking the appointment in everything needs to be documented properly all the time and i appreciate you're all very busy you have mm. lots of patients but it's crucial um in terms of being able to defend you yeah. and that's as i say i will talk till i'm blue in the face about that yeah, you have to protect yourselves yeah. in this yeah um, it's your defense ultimately absolutely. Let's talk about quite a hot topic at this t at this time, uh, regulation. So regulation is basically putting in some laws that will prevent non-medical mm -hmm. professionals from providing these sort of treatments. Obviously, in the UK, we do allow it. Mm -hmm. Do you think regulation will have an impact on the amount of claims that are happening at the moment? Um, no, I don't. I think you've at the moment, in terms of insurance, you've got insurers that will insure non-medics for example for certain mm -hmm. treatments subject to the relevant qualifications then you've got some insurers that won't so i think there's already claims there and i think what the regulation will do is what is ne has been necessary within the industry for many many years you know we do have an industry that is with a vast different <laughs> practitioner type which mm -hmm. is quite different to a lot of other places around the world um but actually instead of saying these people shouldn't be doing it actually encompassing them and incorporating them into the field um actually will help everybody i think and i think it will give everybody a better perspective on different people's journeys as well and it means that they can learn from other peers and as a whole, it will become a safer and sort of more reputable 
industry. I think there's this perception that there are huge volumes of claims. Well, actually, that isn't necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think regulation is now very, very important. I mean, it's been talked about for many, many years. Yes. Um, but we're not going to move away from people wanting to enter the industry. And until we do something to make that more formal, mm. we're always going to have the same problem. So mm. I don't I don't foresee there being any greater problems or I think it will be proportionate to the amount of people that actually are registering themselves and doing the right thing by getting insurance. Mm. So I think it will be proportionate to that. I think oh. it's an interesting one with regulation where in terms of patients wanting to go away and complain and sue or to litigate or to go down the legal route, a lot of patients are nervous or they feel like, if they go to a non-medical practitioner and they get a discounted treatment, they almost can't complain Hmm. or they can't sue because they chose to go to a non-medical practitioner. They made that Mm -hmm. conscious decision. So the regulation won't stop patients from being able to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Should the patient want to go to a non-dentist, have a tooth pulled out, that's their decision. They can go to one. Personally, I wouldn't go to one, (laughs) but it's one of those options. So regulation should just help make patients more aware of who can and can't do these treatments. That's really the only thing and reduce the complication rate overall. Mm. But I think absolutely what Naomi's saying, that the, the the rate of legal complaints or complaints that are going to insurance, they probably won't change because the patients that are complaining, I mean, specifically for Lockton, it's mostly medical professionals that are being covered as well. So the mm-hmm. complaints would be coming through from people that would otherwise be re- part of that regulation to mm. provide the service. So I think complaints wise, it's a, it's a tricky situation. Hmm. The thing I'm more interested in is how does it work? So as a practitioner, mm-hmm. thankfully, touch wood, I've had next to no complaints that have gone down the legal route. Yeah. But what happens if a patient complains, what should I do? And what happens when it comes to legal legal pr- um, proceedings? Okay, I think, first of all, it's cl- uh, important to identify that there are actually two types of complaint or claim. So we, we would call it a complaint. Um, or a claim Mm. and the difference and the reason we differentiate it is because the complaint can be any expression of dissatisfaction so there technically isn't a medical problem and there's no formal injury and there's no legal intervention but as mentioned the client may be just generally dissatisfied with the outcome of the treatment or like a lump or yeah, a or they might have or a little bit of a, didn't yeah, work yeah, or, or they might just need a bit of a tweak or additional treatment or actually you've tried treating a patient over a long period of time but actually they may not be responding to the treatment and, you know, perhaps their journey shouldn't continue, something like that. But they're not asking for compensation. There's no injury. So those kind of scenarios, we would still say speak to your insurance at all times. Mm. Um, I think you made a comment just before we started about never giving a refund without speaking to your insurers. I mean, you can do um, if you think it's appropriate, but it's about the language you use Mm. that if it does still go down a claim, route later on down the line you haven't admitted liability and you haven't jeopardized the position of the insurers at any stage but also your insurers or me personally i'm here to support you and to help you so by you telling me about a generic complaint i'm here to guide you give you wording and give you ideas about how Mm. best to resolve it the artistic facial transformation course is our latest course in aesthetic medicine This course covers the four types of patient we typically see in clinic. Commonly males interested in angles and masculinization, younger females interested in contouring and beautification, profile treatments from hairline to jawline, and the older customer that's not quite surgical but can benefit from non-surgical rejuvenation. Delegates will be taught to use needle and microcannular techniques where we cover multiple layers approaching the face holistically. We cover the four types of face shape, round, square, oval, and triangular, and the three types of class profile, class one, class two, and class three. Using this knowledge, we can show how to balance and create harmony. And the main aim of this course is to show how high volumes of dermal filler can look natural, despite the quantity we use. The, the worry tends to be, sorry to interrupt, no, Amy, no. When, we, when we have a complaint like that, for example, a patient who's had lip filler and now they can't see the result. They had swelling on the day, it looked great. A mm-hmm. week later, swelling's gone down, they feel the lip filler's disappeared. Mm-hmm. It hasn't, it's just they got yeah. used to the swelling. So common complaint, something that we've now managed to do where I just tend to treat patients and say, well, if you like this result, we need to go 10% bigger. Mm. So it ends up at this level once the swelling has gone down. So I've, I've worked my own way around this, but it's a complaint I'm sure many practitioners will face. In, in that scenario, we're worried about telling the insurance, A, are we bothering you? And B, will our premiums go up? Hmm. Yeah. So your premiums, first of all, because that is, I suppose, probably the biggest concern, um, your premiums will only go up if there are payouts okay. on 
um, a policy, but not guaranteed either, because if it's something very minor, um, which there hasn't really been a huge amount of cost associated with, and it's just been a one-off and we've held your policy for five to six years, for example, um, then there may not be any implications. We would say always be as transparent with us as possible. We are here to support you. That's the whole point of having your insurance. And um, whilst everybody's aware of what a car insurer and a home insurer does, and you only speak to them when you do have a serious claim that you need to make, it's not really the same. We're here to work with you at the end of the day. So don't be scared of us. Um, you're not putting us out. That's what we're here to do. And the idea around all aesthetic insurance is to support practitioners to make it easier for you. And obviously you've gained experience over time with various complaints that you've got. But if you're newer into the industry as well, it's very scary and very daunting. And also because you're starting out potentially on your own with your own reputation as a practitioner at risk, so to speak, it can be worrying, I mean, terribly worrying, um, as to what to do, and you can take it very personally. And it's it's about how to handle that, um, and we can guide you through that. So that's what we're here for. But premiums will have be impacted if there are claims that are paid out. But mm. to put it into perspective, um, really out of all of the policyholders we've held, and I can't give you the official number of that, but out of all the policyholders between 2014 and 2021, only... 5.6 to 6.5% of policyholders have made a claim. Wow. wow. And that's a formal claim, though. Yeah. So when I was saying about the difference between a complaint and yeah. a claim, the claim is when you've got the legal intervention, so any letter so from a solicitor. So they're seeking compensation. They're either not, yeah, so they're either seeking compensation via a solicitor or directly, so they can do it themselves. They don't have to have a solicitor. There is an injury that perhaps even if it's within the consent form that they've signed, it's perhaps a little bit worse than it should be or it looks like it's going to be a longer standing problem um those scenarios would be a formal claim um but at all stages we would say speak to us um and i think what i try and do is just help people because to, by working with me on a complaint i can give you some ideas some confidence so if it does happen again it's a little bit easier it's a little bit less stressful and actually just bouncing off somebody and get letting it off your chest um really does help people yeah. i think in this makes a massive difference yeah. when you're first starting out you really feel alone in the industry so knowing that we have our insurance to rely on rather than mm -hmm. be afraid of is actually really reassuring can i ask you a question Rosh? yeah of course so how do you i mean it's very different to when we're hospital practitioners doctors dentists nurses working in a hospital if there's a complaint, it's usually about the service, the treatment. It's rarely about an individual. And even if it is about an individual, it goes to the PAL service, it goes to the head of the department, it rarely goes to the individual. Hmm. In aesthetics, you are the business, or even if you're working for a clinic, the complaint is about the individual, it's about their treatment, it's usually a one-team delivered thing. It's not hmm. really a, an MDT that delivered this hmm. treatment. It can be quite personal. I've, I've taken it quite badly sometimes yes. as if I failed yes. or I did something bad or yes. I did something wrong. And there are statistics where, you know, not every treatment is going to be exactly perfect. At some point, you'll encounter certain complications. It's a numbers game. Um, but how have you felt and how have you dealt with these complications when they've arised? Absolutely. Now, complaints? It, it does feel personal. I, I've been very fortunate in the fact that, uh, you know, it's never gone down the legal route. Mm. But you do feel a little bit personally attacked because... You and I know as doctors, we, we only have our patients' benefit mm. at mind. We only want to help improve their parents, improve their mental health, do whatever we can to try and help them. Mm. And when it sort of twists around and they don't like what you've done, it does feel very personal. It's just one of those things that you're going to have to work through. And like I said before in this podcast, this is all about honesty uh, and integrity. So I'm not going to lie to you and say I've never had a complaint. It does happen. The trick is knowing how to handle it when it does happen, knowing that you have support. I have support you know, with my insurance, with my dermal medical colleagues. You're not alone in this industry. And we encourage you, if you ever go through something like this, reach out to us because we're here to help. Mm. I think that the thing many practitioners I've seen make, make common mistakes, and I think, Naomi, it'd be really good to kind of get your view on this, is they take it personally and they go into denial and mm. they send, lash back out at the patient saying, how dare you? No, you're wrong. And it becomes a, a fight. And, it, and that patient practitioner relationship completely breaks down mm. and they almost forget that there's boundaries and the professionalism goes out the Absolutely. window and they either stop replying to each other or you know and i've had lots of patients come to me with issues for me to then correct and i'm saying well what happened to the original practitioner and they're like we fell out or they stopped replying to me or you know they shut shop 
uh, all these sort of examples. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, where did they go? <laughs> Sometimes they went to medical professionals. Yes. Um, what have you found, um, Naomi? Have, have you had Absolutely. those sort of scenarios? Absolutely. Um, and I think one of the things that I would always suggest is having a formal complaints procedure in process, in place within your practice. Now, that's not for advertising necessarily. So you're not putting it out there so that you're going to attract loads and loads of complaints. It's not for that purpose at all. But it's to give you as a practitioner a structure as to professionally how you need to follow a process if you get a complaint Mm. and try and remove that personal attack. The other issue that we do come across quite regularly is the ways that practitioners communicate with um, their patients. WhatsApp. WhatsApp, (laughs) Instagram messaging, Facebook messenger. Now, completely understand why that might start. And, you know, a lot of uh, individual practitioners will use those platforms to advertise their business. It may be their sole place that is advertised um but it's about keeping it professional Mm -hmm. and i think yes i suppose at the initial stages when you're booking in appointments um it can be useful to have those if you're doing advertising for example for a course of treatments or that sort of thing um however if there's any i mean really it should be via email or via a booking Mm -hmm. system or via a receptionist or yourself if it's just you um, everything needs to be properly recorded and if there's any indication of a complaint then in writing via email would be much much better we can use whatsapp messages text messages screenshots um, but it's incredibly difficult um, to a pull all of that all together and we have to ask you to go into your mm. personal account it is much more professional to do it via email if that is the case. That's a really good uh, tip. Yeah, I'll definitely have to remember that. <laughs> um, okay, let's get to the juicy parts now. Okay. Can you tell us about some of the uh, the biggest payouts or the most interesting cases that you've had in lockdown insurance? Obviously, all of this will be completely anonymized. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> divulge any uh, details. I think it's really across the whole of my experience um, within the aesthetic industry because I have worked in other areas as well. Um I think the key reason why claims are paid out is down to your documentation. So you, for example, I've had two Botox claims. Um, It's interesting because I just didn't think Botox would be a claim. It wears off in three months. months. So (laughs) these are some time ago, these claims, I I must add. Um, But believe me, we still get them. And Mm. a patient has three years um, to raise a claim after Mm. they've last saw you. So if they, for example, state that at the time they didn't feel psychologically able to bring the complaint to you because they were traumatised, they've still got that period of time. Mm. Um, Which is another reason why you need to keep documentation because you might not have seen that patient again and you've seen thousands of others in the interim. Um, But for example, two Botox claims, uh, the same doctor, um, generic side effects that could have been quite easily resolved they weren't particularly well handled as a complaint um so it went to a formal claim they went down the legal route the two patients um together not together under the same claim but at the same time so they were colleagues of each other the patients so they did they had had treatment at the same time we then request paperwork. So part of the process of setting up a formal claim will be to ask for paperwork, your photographs, um, any correspondence, your solicitor's letters, etc., etc. So we request all of that as standard. Um, the patient file consisted of an A4 piece of paper. The A4 piece of paper was blank for both wow. of them and just had the Botox uh, batch number sticker on it. That was it. Mm. Just on just on that profile, I can already picture this kind of clinic, Naomi. High turnover, patients in, out, in, out, mm. in, out, seeing as many patients in one day, 10-minute appointment slots, revolving door mm-hmm. mechanism is what I call it. They walk in, they have the injections, and the patient's walking out holding a piece of gauze because it's not, it's not bleeding <laughs> yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it very much was that kind of situation. Um, I mean, it was hard to identify that the Botox had been completed on these patients because their names weren't on the piece of paper. So how we could prove anything, we couldn't. So the actual costs associated with those claims were £100,000 each we had wow. to settle them because we spent or some... essentially what was just missing documentation. Yeah. And, yeah. and on average, a Botox claim, the payout would be £1,500 mm. if it's mm. something that needs to be paid out. But it was indefensible. We tried to. Um, and I think the costs associated with the legal are always out, always outweigh any damages that are paid hundred thousand pounds for a botox claim. claim that would have resolved itself wow. in three months so yes or could it just been handled better 
Yeah. That practitioner is an example where the premium would have increased as a result. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. But, but not that's actually... an interesting thing, how having the indemnity insurance still protected them from having to pay that out themselves. Yeah. So, but, uh, so essentially it's to protect them financially yeah, and their interests. Absolutely. Yes. And by not having it, and there are practitioners. I know that many don't, practitioners. Which just horrifies me. Um, but then I come from an insurance background. Mm. I am very risk aware. Mm. <laughs> um, and I sit and read all the terms and conditions of an insurance policy, but that's my life. Hi, my name is Dr. Roche, and not too long ago, I was you. I was working in the NHS. I was underpaid, underappreciated, undervalued. I was not enjoying what I was doing. So I made the decision to go into aesthetics, and I've never looked back. I thoroughly enjoy what I do. I go on holidays when I want to go. I uh, work sometimes two hours a day, and I have financial freedom, which is brilliant. I remember being in your position, and getting into the world of aesthetics can be really scary. So we've created an event just for you, the Derma Medical Open Evening. Our first event will be on the 1st of April from 6 to 8 p.m. So for your free refreshments, for sparkling conversation, and to take your first step into the world of aesthetics, book in today. <laughs> Can I ask, were there any ramifications for this particular individual other than a slightly increased premium? We wouldn't, for example, report them to the GMC. Mm -hmm. That would be ultimately up to the patient. We're not in that position at this point. Now, whether regulation coming in in the future would perhaps, there would be some mandate sort of full, that yeah, the mandate or full. Yeah. 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 When we take on a practitioner, we will check registration numbers with the regulatory bodies, um, if there are historical regulatory issues. I mean, it's part of our question set, but we would also investigate further and we always do our own checks because people aren't always truthful. Mm. Um, so yeah, we wouldn't implement that, but actually going forward, having that two-way conversation from insurers to regulatory bodies or having a pool of information between different um, areas of the market because there are other things like training companies for example that are seeing practitioners if everybody was communicative and there was a certain transparency then I think that could make it even safer so my clinic's primarily injectables mm -hmm. botulinum toxin dermal filler high margin treatments yep. um, patient centered care um, but do you see many Filler claims, is that more popular? Does that tend to happen more than Botox claims? Or is it more lasers? Because I've got colleagues that have had lots of laser claims because lasers mm -hmm. seem to be a bit more risky with burns. I've seen that as well. Tattoo issues, yes. lots of other issues. What, what are you sort of seeing as an aesthetic treatment? What's the most complained or claimed would, about treatment? I would say year on year, dermal filler and IPO and non-ablative laser mm. are the two mm. areas that are the most commonly um, claimed against. However, to caveat that, they are also the most insured treatments okay. and the most and commonly also the performed. Most so commonly it, performed. Yeah. Thousands so it's and thousands proportionate done each day. again to yeah. the volume of clients. The large majority of each policy will have dermal fillers on it, for example. Mm. Um, less so with the laser. Mm. The difference between the dermal fillers and the laser is sort of the ultimate permanent damage, I suppose. I mean, obviously there can be some with dermal filler, but you're more likely to have the burns. You're more likely to have scarring. There are complications with tattoo removal that is a common mm. problem area um so those claims will have higher payouts as a result um the dermal villa claims will be more complaints and general dissatisfactions that could be managed opposed to formal claims wow okay mm. and in terms of payouts mm -hmm. as an interest are there many dermal villa related payouts and, and in, in those instances what, what was the, the issue? Why, why was the payout made? Was it negligence or was it other issues? So I'd say about 26% are paid out for okay. dermal filler claims. And on average, the payout amount is around £11,000. Wow. But that's inclusive of the damages, mm. if there are any, the defence costs and the claimant's legal costs. Okay. So that's all encompassed within the payout amount and the legal costs will be proportionally higher okay. than the damages if there are any. The reasons for payout vary. There are times when there may be an injury that needs to be compensated for. Um, and if there is, then if there's any sort of indication that that's the case, then insurers would perhaps say, look, actually, let's look to settle this as quickly as possible. It reduces the legal costs. This is the suggestion. Um, and that could be done on a without prejudice basis as well. So there's no admission of liability, but it can be done to close the matter. So this perception that insurers just pay out, it's not always that we just pay out. Um, but if we do, 
it's actually to help you in the long run, legal, mm. right, in terms of the legal cost. Whilst we're paying for it initially, if it does impact your premium, it will come back and you will be paying for it in a sense in the future. Um, the other most common reason why claims are settled, which is why I harp on about it, is paperwork. Mm. because it's indefensible yeah. because paperwork and documentation um is very very can be not in all cases can be very very poor and it's got better with electronic systems now i would say that was gonna be my next question actually there okay go. <laughs> yeah do you think it's better with things like pabu and clever clinic do you think the built-in systems that they have are enough to protect the injector if they're completed correctly and there yes. are ways obviously built within those systems which prevents a practitioner from move moving on exactly yeah. and those, those kind of tools are brilliant mm. um it's still not f foolproof mm. i would say because if an, an ad hoc note for example I is say, what if someone goes back after a complete claim and says well i'm just going to update that documentation to protect myself more well, i'm guessing that wouldn't stand up because they've added that in after the claims yeah. happened and one of the, the um built-in elements of these softwares is that it's date stamped if there are changes made mm -hmm. and i've spoken to a lot of these companies over the last five or six years as they've sort of developed and that was one of my key points because i have seen claims that have been thrown out when handwritten notes have been modified after the date mm -hmm. and you wouldn't necessarily think but it was picked up by the solicitor mm -hmm. um and obviously that then has then jeopardize the claim so mm -hmm. yes they, they do they are good systems um and they do help definitely and it, it means that photographs and things like that are all built in um but when How i saw important are photographs extremely important hmm. we would say before and after photographs on every single treatment botox too yeah empathy. Wow. even if it's not an immediate result and the reason being is with the rise of you know, your phones and the software that built into phones and the patient taking selfies, social media, filters. It's very easy for a patient to go away and say, oh my goodness, look, this is what's happened to me because of a photo that they've taken. Mm. But it's your evidence that they left your clinic as they did, for example. Mm. Um, so yes, and any review appointments, we would say photographs. Obviously there are occasions when patients don't consent to photographs, but you need to have a written disclaimer, so to speak. I or personally don't treat. If yeah, they refuse... I wouldn't consent photography mm -hmm. then i won't treat okay well yeah. that's perfect because yeah. that's to protect ourselves right yeah absolutely yeah. and i think it's identifying where those that would be another red flag and it's identifying those types of patients and actually having the confidence to say no and turn people away there are a lot of people that still feel pressured by the patient and would still treat them even though their gut says oh, i really shouldn't be doing that mm. um i've had patients where they try to hide who they are during the photographs so they say, well, you're only treating my lips, so I'm going to hide the rest of my face. <laughs> and I'm taking a photo like that. And I'm like, that's not good enough because that won't stand up. That could be anyone's yeah. lips. Yeah. I need your full face. And, like, and it's not going to be shared because they haven't ticked that box no, on exactly. consent. So, um, but those are the sort of patients where then if you really weed down into the consultation, mm -hmm. you kind of realize the reason they don't want the full photograph taken is because they have a psychological trauma and they just can't take photographs of their face or have mm -hmm. someone else take photographs of their face. And it, it's essentially an underlying psychological issue they're trying to address. And no amount of federal or Botox will fix that. The other issue is uh, age as well. I'm not sure about you, Amir, but I've often had young girls come into my clinic mm -hmm. claiming that they're over 18, but they might be 16 or 17. And that's obviously a complete no-no in the industry. Yeah. So um, if someone were to come into my clinic claiming yeah. that they were 18, but I didn't check their ID, would would I get in trouble for that? Is that acceptable? To be fair, I haven't actually come against up against it in a claim situation. Um, <clears throat> the majority of practitioners that I have dealt with have been able to check in one way shape or form mm. and if there is a patient that is under 18 um but there's a medical reason why they are being referred for treatment for example laser hair remains fall on the face or something like that then parental consent and guardian consent we will do a sort of case by case referral for those and we can extend it um i have as i say i haven't come again up against it mm. particularly where there has been a claim as a result i think that if a patient who has lied about their age then tries to make a claim, they're going to be even more hot water. Um, so I think it's unlikely that they would. Mm. Um, but never say never. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. What's what's the largest aesthetic payout? <laughs> Good question. Seen? Not in your company, just generally in your industry that you've seen or heard oh, about. It can go into billions, ultimately. It yeah, depends wow. on the, the level of injury. I think that I've seen, I would say that when more permanent fillers were being used, mm. a, a 
at the beginning, well, not really right at the beginning, but mm. 10 years ago, let's mm. say, for example, there were issues the things with... Things that were silicon-based and those are and things what I call my, nasty fillers. Yeah, and migrate around the eye area. But also the experience of practitioners and the peer groups that were available were a lot fewer. Mm. Um, and people didn't really know the long-term effects. Mm. Um, so there were probably higher payouts at that time as a result of all of those factors. But mm. where treatment has migrated, for example, into the eye and caused blindness mm. those are going to be the larger claims and it could mm. be hundreds of thousands of pounds mm. have you could, seen many cases where there's fillers led to blindness not certainly not in the last few years okay. um but i have seen s several in my time okay. um and the way that the claim will be paid out and the way damages would be awarded would be the long-term effect that's going to have on a patient mm. and a younger patient who may be 18 for example mm. um obviously they've got a lot longer of their life it's going to affect them with their work and their income so that's how the payout would be mm. um calculated ultimately there were seven cases of blindness in australia last year wow. secondary to filler i wonder uh, if that's i wonder the if fillers? Not, I, which I, fillers I, were being used there don't know mm. i don't know the technique being done and the training behind the individuals don't know if they're medical practitioners also just don't know if it's an underreported thing yes is it just being underreported and it's just not really being I, I don't i think available. in the uk we probably would report it more i think okay. in australia perhaps it may be slightly different because the regulations out there mm. in surrounding aesthetics is completely different you know you have to be a medical registered practitioner yeah. they are very very strict yeah. um fillers prescription over there too yeah just not here so there have i have known practitioners that have gone to australia and emigrated from the uk but actually are coming back because not solely because of mm. that but Partly because setting up their own business as an individual is very, very difficult. It's yeah. much easier as an entity mm -hmm. out there. So perhaps it might be underreported because perhaps more people are doing treatments that shouldn't necessarily be doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about that industry. But in the UK, I think people, if there is something as serious as that, that, there's no way you can't report it. It's interesting. We probably are performing the same number of treatments in the UK as we are in Australia. But if we're having less blindness here, maybe it's a training thing. Maybe that there is more formalized training that's done in a safer way, or maybe people aren't performing as risky procedures. Or definitely if you go to Derma Medical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but definitely complications management as well, because if the patient is treated for, I mean, it's not always, and now I'm not medical, but it's not always an instant mm. blindness that occurs. Um, and it can be because a practitioner doesn't necessarily handle the complication in and time. then it yeah in time and then it leads on to that so i think we're actually very good at complications management and there's a huge awareness and many courses including including derma medical about complications and it is incorporated in most courses as it should be which is exactly why we've just launched our complications course well, there you go. I didn't, there you go. <laughs> good segue <Amber. laughs> um excellent so naomi could you briefly summarise your top tips for injectors to try and protect themselves as much as possible mm -hmm. from an insurance perspective? I think my tips will be for all practitioners, really, any aesthetic practitioner. Um, I think it's generic across the board, but obviously your audience predominantly is injectors. Um, first of all, paperwork. Everything needs to be documented. So this goes from your initial consultation, every conversation you have within that consultation about what the client is trying to achieve, what you've told them and managed, how you've managed those expectations, what you can achieve. You know, if they're not going to be a Kim Kardashian, they're going to be a Mary Berry at the end of the treatment process. They need to know that. And that needs to be documented, um, incorporated in that photographs um, and making sure that they are completely understanding of side effects and implications. Mm -hmm. What I do suggest for those that still use paper documentation, for example, is there can be certain points, so there could be side effects, and they could just initial next to each of them. Now, I appreciate, as I said before, time is difficult, mm -hmm. but this saves you time in the long run. Um, and actually, if a claim's going on, the amount of questions I might ask when you submit a claim and the amount of work we might need you to do to try and decipher what has happened is all done mm. if you do it in the first time. Um, so documentation and photographs, that is your defence. Verbal recollections two years down the line of how you, how you treated that patient mm. is not going to be any form of defence for you. Mm. So it's not going to be substantial and it won't be accepted. So if you don't have it written down, it didn't happen is the way to think of that. So that's my main tip, I would say. Uh, the managing expectations as well, that's mm. key. I think when you've touched on the psychological 
aspects, doing the psychological assessment as part of your consultation to try and ascertain if there is anything underlying, especially with social media um, and this expectation to look a certain way and look like all these celebrities that actually are all using filters, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but managing that and being very, very clear. Um, and then your red flags and saying no and trusting your gut. I think that's another key one, as we've, as we've discussed. Being able to have the confidence to say no and turn somebody away. Because most um, clients that I've had raise a claim or who have received complaints have said to me, I knew in my gut I shouldn't have taken that patient on. Hmm. And it, but they did it because they were coerced or they felt they had a duty to help that patient. It, if your gut says no or there's any other indication, just don't do it. It's not worth it. And, yes, you might have a perhaps a slightly rubbish review on your website, for example, as a result of it about your service, but it's far better than getting a review to say they got injured or you've got a claim um, and that, you know, taking up a lot of your time. So those are my three sort of key areas. Um, but also speak to your insurers. Have insurance, obviously. Mm. <laughs> That's kind of key. Um, but speak to your insurers. We're not as boring as you might think, uh, especially in aesthetics, mm -hmm. which is why I've stayed in this industry for so long. Um, I think if I was doing property insurance, um, I may have diversified um, over the years, but aesthetics is, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I love learning from people like yourselves um, and being involved with your journeys as much as the patients. Um, but talk to us, we're here to help you, we're here to support you. And we've been doing it a long time now. So, you know, we're not here just to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Naomi. That's, That's right. been really, really insightful. I think there's a lot of stuff there that I will incorporate into my own practice. I'm not sure about you, Amrit. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. So thanks so much, Naomi, for That's joining right. us. No problem. Amrit, Thank you for having me. Thank always you. a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for listening, guys. If you have any questions for Naomi or for us, please do get in contact. Remember to like and share and let us know what you want to hear next. Um, on the next podcast, we'll be getting one of our trainers in, uh, Natasha, who's a dentist, who will be hopefully giving her perspective of what it's like being a dentist in the industry. Thanks so much for listening and see you next time. Okay.